Cool. Um, do you mind um, expanding that, Owen? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Cherry yeah. button the top. Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> sorry. It's been a while. All good. All right, cool. Welcome, everyone. So November meeting. Um, we're only a few days away from the AGM. So we'll have a slides just to touch on that and talk about that because that's important. Um, but we'll just skip to the next slide. So uh, we'll start off with our usual secretary's report, treasurer, so our finances, uh, as executive report, I'll do that a bit on the committees. So that's comms, engagement and policy. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about integrity, accountability and transparency um, after we touch on the AGM. Um, yeah, so members, thank you, Owen. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the membership is still stable. I guess um, you guys might have heard recently, um, you know, we finished the audit by the Electoral Commission. So that means um, they believe these numbers that we have at least 1500. Um, and yeah, to put it into some perspective, a few parties are being deregistered at the moment. So um, I guess, yeah, keeping keeping our numbers up, it's um, no easy feat. Um, yeah. yeah, good job, Owen. Um, Owen and Miles really drove that and a few other people. Do you want to give a shout out to the other people that- Yeah, especially um, Alex Valentine as well, put in a effective effort. Um, awesome. I guess, yeah, you know, we need to make sure, it would be very handy to get some sort of address validation going on. Um, anyway, something for next year. <laughs> cool. Uh, oh, we're moving on. Um, okay, I can do a quick run on these then. Um, so we didn't do a financial report last month. So this profit loss is just of the of the last two months. Um, two relatively quiet months. No outstanding. Uh, no sort of no um sort of unique payments. It was mostly the the uh the standard income uh of, of, of monthly recurring payments um which does seem want to be to have been a little bit lower um over this last couple of months i'm going to need to check on a couple of things there um i'm not sure whether or not maybe there are any issues in there but um we have also uh there have been some efforts made to reduce some of the, the monthly expenses as well so <clears throat> Um, there's a couple of things potentially yeah, that are, that are a fair bit lower there. Um, and um, so, yeah, we've still sort of come out with a tiny little profit over the last two months. Um, so that's that's that one. And then the next one slide is the balance sheet um, and uh, shows sort of over the last couple of months. So we've been slowly building up these these funds up a little bit more. So that's, uh, that's, that's coming back. There's a couple of things still in there that are um, some outstanding items that just haven't been um fully moved around yet um but uh but yep yeah, that's our net assets they're sitting at uh, about uh, roughly three and a half thousand um so oh okay cool rushing through <laughs> um so yeah that's 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 everything on the that, that's everything on the, on the financial stuff anyway so um unless there's any questions there Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. All right. So executive report. So just a reminder that we have an, a fortnightly executive meeting and that's open to all members to observe. So the next meeting we have is Thursday 9th of November. Um, AGM exec election coming up. So we have the AGM on Sunday 5th. So make sure that you um, RSVP. Um, we do have an event link for that. So uh, if you go to our events page, you'll see the the event for the AGM and that's where you can RSVP and get the, the Zoom link and everything like that. So it's really important people come to that because that's where you get to vote for your executive and then you get to vote on proposed um, amendments to the constitution, kind of like the referendum. So yeah, that's important for us there. And then later tonight, we'll talk about um, our commitment to integrity, accountability and transparency. Uh, there's a lot to this topic, but it's just timely because it's leading us towards electing our new candidates. So something to think about and maintain as we go on. And yes, our contact details are there. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm the chair for engagement. So what we have here is the events calendar. And I notice if people don't have access to the events calendar, it's um, on our events page. But what I'll do is I'll send a link to these slides under our YouTube video, so then people can refer to it there. Um, Miles, good to see you online. Uh, do you want to say anything about state-based coordinators? I know you've been working on that. 
Uh, yes, I'm just trying to find my presentation though. Could you give me a minute or two? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. We'll just move on and then let us know when you're ready. Um, new volunteer induction sessions as well, which Miles has been um, facilitating. So I'd be curious to hear more about that as well. Um, and the candidate information sessions also run by Miles. Um, we've also had the new member profile podcast. So we have three episodes on YouTube at the moment um, with uh, Stephen Schwer, Ron Dagan, and Chris Juba. If anyone is keen to be, just have a chat. It's just an informal chat of like, why are you even here? What's you even like about Fusion? Um, and I would like to make a call out for females to, to put their hands up because it's quite male dominated so far. So that's it for engagement. Do we have Angus? Nope. Okay. Uh, Angus does comms. Uh, so just a shout out for newsletter contributions. We have a monthly newsletter. If there's anything that's been a bit of a passion project for you politically and you'd like to share a bit of your knowledge and expertise, please feel free to email comms at fusionparty.org.au. Um, and we also have a, a pitch form. So we have a Google form where you can, if you have an idea for a session that you'd like to educate on, you would have seen Austin talk about housing and um, and yeah, Owen also did speak about housing and just, yeah, if anyone has anything they want to share, pitch your triple M now policy. So I actually reached out to, um, some members of the transhumanism community in Sydney recently to start looking at an AI centric policy. And the idea being that, uh, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that we can be a thought leader in um, in within the field of AI policy in Australia, both AI safety, but also um, make sure that we can get the benefits of it. And I think we have the potential to be a world leader. And there is a debate within AI safety circles about whether Australia does have the technical and academic and uh, professional research potential to um, be a world competitor. And I think the the debate is is moving in the favor of yes. And so I think this could be a core issue for us. And I think it should be a core issue for us over the next at least um, moving into the the next year and the upcoming federal election. And so I want to do some organizing around that and some campaigns around that. So if anyone is interested in that issue, either as a policy writer or to support that campaign in some other fashion, uh, please get in touch. I'd love your help. Yeah, actually, Thanks, I just Charles. got an that's email it, that's... from... Oh, sorry. You go on, Michael. As I said, yeah, that's that's certainly a... Um, a, a... But policy work stream, we should be, uh, we can be, we can be spinning up um, as, as sort of among a number of them. We, um, yeah, we'll definitely need and anyone who is interested in that kind of thing. And so, if we get sort of a core group of people interested in a particular thing and and writing writing a particular policy or developing that policy, it's it's worth um, sort of uh, it's worth doing that. Uh, but yeah, we'll have we'll certainly be trying to get a, a lot more different kinds of policy work streams up. Um, you go, Owen, and I'll continue with the policy update. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just thinking, I got an email today that um, Ed Husich, our Minister for Innovation, he's travelling to the UK at the moment to discuss AI safety. But, um, yeah, I guess, like, reading that, it seems as though isn't it going to be the same as, you know, technological innovation so far? You know, we spend less than the OECD average on R&D, and we have less than half the internet speeds of the OECD. So well, that that's exactly right, and that's our legacy politicians, primarily from the Liberal Party, but also uh, Labor as well, have consistently left this country behind in terms of both research investment, but also investing in infrastructure and development to make sure that we are technologically enabled and connected. And so I'm I'm incredibly jealous of my colleagues in Europe, um, who who have such a uh, such a dense concentration of political activism and um, and ideas and people that they are able to have that dense nucleus of uh, of technological development research. So there's some really interesting things happening there as well. Uh, in terms of AI research, the um, at least the AI safety movement is probably most closely clustered around Berkeley and San Francisco, uh, particularly MIT, but also to a lesser extent um, Oxford. I'd probably name as well as some of the current world leaders in in thinking and research. But um, they're very much approaching it from a uh, technical perspective. And so with Infusion Party, we have the potential to be a world leader for policy and governance to to develop a um, a set of policies which isn't pessimistic, which isn't doomerist, which isn't uh, anti-technologist, but rather acknowledges um, acknowledges that there are genuine risks with with emerging technologies. 
and uh, but it comes up with a common common sense way to regulate those while still preserving the the benefits and the potential that technology always has to offer us. Thank, <clears throat> thanks, Miles. Um, I'm actually losing my voice, unfortunately. Um, the yeah, so just just to continue with the the, the, the policy committee update. Um, so yeah, the, no, um, just we'll tell you when the next slide is. Sorry. Um, the um so the it's been on there for a while is the the policy intake form so that on the website the web, uh, fusionparty.org.au slash policy intake uh it's sort of that that older form that's that's been there for any sort of submissions um again it's been a sort of a difficult one to kind of manage in that regard and, and getting back to people properly uh but we do have a uh sort of a better solution for this on the on the way um that will, that will hopefully sort of make this ability to collaborate and, and put things forward a lot easier uh, so sort of watch space for that. Um, the uh, following this meeting, uh, we will have our sort of fortnightly uh, policy development meeting. We're fo again focusing on housing policy. Housing policy is uh, continues to be uh, the progress on it continues to be a lot slower than uh, we've we've been hoping. Uh, but we're sort of really getting into the weeds now of the um, of the major proposals and the the wording of them and making sure that. Uh, the proposals have solid uh, reference and citation and evidence backing uh, behind them so that uh, we can sort of really be confident with the, our assertions on that. So if you are, if you do have capacity to to join us for that um, uh, or I, either this evening or sort of ongoing, please uh, uh, st stick around and or email us at uh, policy at fusion.org.au and we'll make sure we get you onto the, the working documents and, and access to whatever you need. Uh, um, other than that, um, yeah, there is still sort of ongoing, there's sort of other been, there have been other little work streams that have been happening. Um, so we do have, uh, we did make a submission um, on the middle arm uh, project, thanks to um, Bryony. So we'll have some information about that, hopefully going out, but sort of more information on that soon. That was put out through Discord and, and some other channels of it. And um, the, the other is some work on rewording our climate emergency uh, policy wording, which is not necessarily policy changes, but mostly just bringing that up to uh, sort of modernizing it and bringing it uh, up to date with a few different things. Um, now, finally, there is a what we're plan planning is a um, a semi regular, but not necessarily scheduled sort of policy newsletter. So um, if you look at the if you if you've been subscribed to the, the standard newsletters, um, you've been automatically subscribed to this, so we won't just spam you, uh, but there'll be an ability to unsubscribe from it if you need to, uh, but we'll be sort of trying to every now and then, or as often as we can, uh, without spamming, provide you with uh, some updates on the various um, work streams and the thing, the updates and, and, and work that's being done, as well as how to get involved. So, uh, yeah, other, other than that, any questions, yeah, shoot us through to uh, policy app. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it for me. Very good. Any questions from anyone? And Miles, did you speak to all of the um, state coordinator volunteer candidate information session? Yeah, so I can um I can I'd like to say a few words about that. Um we so with the the new operations plan, we're running a regular series of events um online. And we've also recently launched our uh, state branch uh kickoff. And so um, the the main main thing for for general members is to, that we're recruiting for state organizers is the big push at the moment. Uh, we can um, state and local organizers in your local area, and um, but we do have other areas of volunteering as well, such as uh, supporting with member outreach and engagement, and um, to a lesser extent supporting on social media, and the, and also potentially the um, this AI policy uh, campaign w would also be national wide as well. But, um, but the main thing is the state branch launch at the moment. And so we currently are organizing in um, in most states or all states, actually. We've started onboarding and training state coordinators and local organizers um, in, in the new plan. And with a little bit of luck, we'll be able to see this through to actually mm -hmm. launching, um, launching a series of branches over the next 12 to 18 months. I have a lot of hopes there. Um, we have a lot of really exciting talent coming through. 
But for those people who are interested in getting involved, there's um, we need help right now with uh, with phone banking and member outreach. Um, otherwise, if you're in one of your state capitals, I'd also love you to get involved in um, in, in supporting the local organizing there. You can reach out to me on uh, Discord or email or social media. I'm quite approachable. And um, or also come along to one of the online trainings. And so um, we run regular monthly volunteer inductions. Uh, the next one is, I believe, the 12th. So not next week. I'm just double checking. Sorry, the 14th. So two weeks away, just around two weeks away on the Tuesday is the next volunteer orientation. Um, but we'll also um, we're also running periodic uh, candid info sessions for anyone who is interested in learning more about uh, what's involved in running for election. And so the next one from those will actually be the 25th this month. And we'll have uh, we'll have previous candidates speaking and letting you know what's involved. And uh, the other thing we'll be running as well is the um, the state organizer and and coordinator support meetings. And so that'll be primarily aimed at people who are um, launching these state branches to support each other and share ideas and um, build up a sort of community practice around around that. Just unmuting. Cooley Dawes, anyone have any questions on that? Oh, being in those meetings and want to say anything about that? Yeah, well, thank you for your hard work there, Miles. So, all right, we'll move on. So upcoming uh, 5th of November on Sunday is our AGM. So this will run for roughly about two hours considering all the things that we have to pack in. Um, so the link to the event is there, but you can just also find us on the events page. Uh, so what we need our members to do is to come and vote on the proposed constitutional amendments, which are found at that URL link. So you can find all the documents and the details there. Um, and then we can have the opportunity to vote for new fusion exec. So people who have nominated to form the fusion exec because we vote for them every AGM. Um, and then after this meeting, we'll have two weeks for members to, to think about and vote for those candidates. So a bit of time just to research or to um, look at the AGM video because we'll have them do a bit of a pitch as well in the video. Next slide, thank you. Oh, I'm not too late to nominate the executive yourself, anyone watching. Yes, so the, the deadline to nominate um, to be on the thing is one day before the AGM. So you have mm. until the third. Cool. Um, is that it? Uh, Oh, I think, okay, for some reason the slides didn't. Oh, is it in a separate document? No, it should be there. Maybe it's just because I put it in and you might need to reload it. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While we're here, we could also potentially talk a little bit about the proposed constitutional amendments to um to discuss at the AGM because they are quite detailed and there's a lot of content there. Good idea. So um, the reason why uh, we're touching on integrity, accountability, transparency is it's something that's quite important to Fusion. We have a stance on that um, in ethical governance. So we have a few specific policies, but we just generally want to walk the talk. Um, and so just a reminder here, things to look out for um, and just do your due diligence um, for whoever that you vote for in um, Fusion or in, in other scenarios or organizations but this is specifically related to fusion so when we have the agm just consider some of the questions that you'd like to ask the candidates and have a discussion with them about what you'd like to see happen in fusion and so here's just a bit of a guide about a few things to consider um, for voting so that's it there um we'll paste these um the 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 link to these slides on the YouTube video so you can have more of a detailed look. I don't expect anyone to memorize all of this. All right, so we have some time. Miles, did you want to speak to constitution amendments? 
Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So um, the I've put forward a set of proposed draft, uh, a, a draft set of amendments, proposed amendments, and um, there's a variety of different changes in there. Um, so a lot of the changes in my draft I have adopted from Andrea Leung's earlier draft containing a lot of formatting changes, tweaks, and cleanups. Um, there has been, uh, so th this is the, this will be the third general meeting, I believe, that we've been through with this constitution. Um, and it has been through a lot of significant cleanups since the um, since the earliest incarnation of it, when it was originally the Vote Planet Constitution. And um, I'm glad, glad to see that a lot of those cleanups are um, less substantial and now just, just little tweaks. Um, but but there is still a lot of legacy things that which there which we're cleaning up. And so a lot of the by quantity, most of the changes are just little formats like that. Um what uh what I'd like to do at some point is to go through and write a text-based description of of most of the changes. Um the the significant changes put in um which uh, which are not just formatting or actual changes. Uh, I've put in a restructure of the executive, largely to um, to simplify and clean up some of the roles. And so um, one of those areas is with the deputy positions that they're not fully um, not fully explained, and uh, and 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 there there are further sort of improvements and formalizations we can make with those deputy positions as well. Um, I've also put in a change to um, to remove the convener position because it's caused a huge amount of confusion around what the wording and purpose of it actually is. And um, it seems a bit of an arbitrary distinction to me to separate that from any kind of chair roles. Uh, I've also, um, I've al I'm also proposing to remove the position of national campaigns coordinator from the executive because like the convener, there has been a lot of confusion around what the role is. And um, and unlike the convener and the president, where there's a lot of overlap, for the national campaigns coordinator, there's no clear structure or um, or, or kind of a mandate for it. It's not it's not really administrative role, but there's just sort of a, a huge open space. And so, um, in, in terms of campaigning, I've always felt and argued that it should be more of a, um, that we should be working more of an administrative background or perspective from that. Well, the, the we 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 develop structures. And adjust them and 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 discard them or amend them as needed and they come and go rather than um and this is also a general sort of philosophical principle that we should be able to adjust those systems and structures with much more flexibility rather than forcing it so um i've made some other similar sort of clear ups as well um so there's a few procedural things the biggest change is uh, is around um, over the whole amendment is around the branch structure where um, the uh, I've removed I'm proposing to remove some of the privileges around candidate pre-selection and um, move it to a straight member vote is one of the big changes another change I've made is to restructure a slight restructure of the branches so that um, to enable state geographic branches. And the way I've done that is through um, uh, firstly renaming them to member organizations because there has been a lot of confusion around that. And so this way we can introduce, um, so, so with, the, with this change set, we'll have the concept of human members who have voting rights and so on and so forth, and then member organizations, which is more like um, a sort of like a, a formalized internal faction process. And so the member organizations, uh, for example, would retain the automatic representative on the executive as, as a way to um, make sure that they have representation um, for, for, for whatever they're representing. And so the way this is compatible with uh, geographic state branches is that I've added a subtype of member organization um, which is the which is an exception to the only uh, membership of only one branch allowed. So ordinarily, people would only be allowed in one branch um, unless it's a state geographic branch and designated that by the executive. In which case, you're allowed to be a member of that 
as well as your your ideological or, or party branches. And um, and so that I think that works quite nicely as a sort of subset. So it removes a lot of duplication and allows a little bit more sort of standardization and consistency in the way member organizations work. And um, and should and, and should work quite nicely with the way we've operated as well. And so um, uh, the initially when we started, there was a, so for example, there was a clause when we first started Infusion with our first branch, um, our first constitution, our first version of it, we had a, um, a provision which, uh, which, is, which essentially had that there should be an equal number from all party branches, equal number on the executive. Um, we, we've gone through, we've adjusted that and made it so there's only one representative from each branch. And so now it's a little bit simpler and more straightforward how we determine that. And so these are ways some of the, the, the sort of streamlining and standardizing we've gone through things because what we found was that when, um, with that previous rule, when, uh, one executive member would change or another, then suddenly we'd have to adjust, we, we'd, um, there'd be an adjustment to the number of positions we're entitled to for each branch. And so things could rapidly get complicated. Um, one other change I made, which I'm just trying to find the wording from, uh, oh yeah, is the, um, is the code of conduct because it hasn't actually been defined in the constitution anywhere. And, but there are a lot of references to it in various places. And so, um, given that there has been significant debate, uh, definitely outside of the party, um, around, what is the purpose and role of code of conduct? And we've also seen examples of how they can be abused. Um, and so with that historical, um, with that sort of history in mind, I felt like that it was important to put it into the constitution in a way which would, uh, which, which would further the interests of the association um, while also supporting the community and, um, and minimizing that risk of abuse as well. And so the way I've entered it into the constitution is uh very tied in very closely with the values section under part one. And so um, what I've said is that uh, I've quite simply said, there shall exist a code of conduct for the association that is derived primarily from and in accordance with the value framework. And then the second part of that is that the code of conduct for the association may only be altered by special resolution at a general meeting of the association. So um, there's, there's a couple of big implications here. One is that our value framework is very strongly defined in the constitution and there are many clear formal processes around it. And so the value framework is, is sort of like the core of what we do and why we do and how we do it. And so we do go through processes to, to, to change or adjust or update that, but they're formal, they're very democratic, they're very consultative and, um, and, and although they can be a little exhausting or lengthy at times, they're very worthwhile to gain a better understanding of what we're trying to do. And so the code, I think it it, it kind of, it, it seems very obvious to me that the code of conduct should be derived from that and should be very much in accordance with that. Um, but also making it so that it can only be changed by special resolution means that um, there has to be that large, strong element of oversight over it, that it is, con um, it is, it is concordant with the values. And, um, and so there's additional checks and balances there, but also that it can't just be changed um, by anyone who has access to the website, for example, or anyone in the executive can just decide, oh, we're just going to change the code of conduct today. And then suddenly you might find, oh, there's something in there which is actually potentially quite problematic or or or, or maybe not problematic, but it could have been improved by, by this longer consultative process. <clears throat> so that's the, um, that would be all of the substantive changes. Um, as I said, there is a large quantity of minor changes and cleanups, um, most of which we have Andrea Leong to thank for doing that, um, but with additional ones I've put in as well. Okay. So, Miles, will you have, um, you did mention you wanted to have a bit of a written summary. Are you anticipating you'll prepare something for the AGM to share? Prior to the AGM, yes, but uh, by the AGM at the latest. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm. Anything else to say there? I'd love to uh, open this up conversation more broadly, and um, hear from 
um, particularly hear from some of the other founders who um, who 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 have have haven't been as active over the previous six to twelve months, because we um, we did have a strong core set of people who brought this together initially, um, who some of whom aren't active at the moment for various reasons, and I think it's important that we do. Um, al- although there aren't there aren't major changes in my in my amendments here. I'd like to have those conversations um, as either as a formal process, or or at least to 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 get feedback, and um and we keep evolving, and uh and and discussing the structure of for what we want to do to make sure it's fit for purpose. Yep. Um. Could I jump in for a sec, Ben? Please. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, I thought I'd sign in tonight given that this was on the agenda and um, I did make some of those amendments, which uh, I was happy for the executive to um, put forward uh, and add to as they saw fit before the AGM. Um, and I think it's no secret that um, my view is that the um the branch structure the structure of having formal branches with special privileges within fusion was something that worked at the the coming together uh, at the time of the merger and um has become less relevant and so that's part of what i'd propose is to um remove any formal branch structure um the science party um, also doesn't. There's not really any call for the science party to exist with um, as a a formal organisation. I don't think. Um, you know, I'm very proud of the work that the science party's done, but it's now uh, merged into fusion, and. Um, you know, I'd hope that the the members that have come across from the science party into fusion are keeping those policies uh, at the forefront. So, um, yeah, that I did want to just um, share some of my reasons for making those suggestions and also find out what the main differences were between the two proposals that are going to be put up at the AGM. Yeah, actually, Andrew, on that point of um, the you know merging the branches together more, I guess um, yeah, Miles, the idea that um, we keep the branches separate and they maintain their identity, I guess um, I don't see all parties being independent for that long. Um, if we think of like, I guess climate justice was our smallest branch, wasn't it? You know, like who's to say the small branches will continue to really be independent? And then, you know, 50 years later, while the fusion party is still going strong, you know, what if we have all these, yeah, I guess like climate justice people on our exec when nobody really identifies as climate justice anymore? Well, the nice thing about that is that we do have processes to actually, um, th- so there's a minimum number of requi- members required to be a branch, for example, and the number is currently 50, which is potentially a little low. Uh, if if we are going to maintain the current growth trajectory, then um, or, or for example, hypothetically double in size, then um, yeah, you know, we need to think about different ways we could structure this. But some some branches have made it clear that they do want to start to dissolve, not just Science Party, um, but other branches as well. Uh, whereas some branches have made it clear they do want to remain active and uh, and. And, and continue with that identity. And so even though some people might feel inclined to hold on to or, or, or advocate for specific subsets of policy, and that's fine, it makes, I think it makes sense to me. And, and it's a, it's a good thing that we actually can actually have some organization around specific policy sets or ideas or cultural values to, uh, to, to coordinate around that. I, um, think it's it's not so much the 
I'm, I'm for dissolving the branches. I think it's important that the different values, there's people on the exec or kind of in the inner circle that can cover off on all the values. So, you know, most people would two or three of the values might resonate strongest with them. So I, I, I don't know how you control for that, but. Well, the current system handles that, but dissolving the branches mean there'll be no, there'll be none of that. There'll be no guarantee and there probably won't be any kind of that kind of diversity. Mm. So that's why that's what having a formal system means is it's functionally a, a one of the elements is a, a quota system on the executive Another um, uh, another significant point to maintaining the branches or, or the branch system, however, so sort of called or structured, is um, is not just that it was part of the founding rationale to bring us together, but also that it presents a viable model in politics for us moving forward. And uh, and and I've tried to make the point again and again. I'll continue to make the point that what we were doing to three, four, five, six, ten years ago wasn't working and it didn't work for that time. And so we have to be willing to try a new model and consider a new model, which is what we have now, this new model, which has never been done before in politics. And it resonates very strongly. Everyone understands clearly why we came together and, and how we came together. And they know that it's unique and they know that it's special and powerful. And I've spoken to many, many members over the past two years who ca who came in and joined or gave a special notice for that. And so that's a strength that we can take into the future in, in a sense, in a very practical sense in that uh, other external parties or groups can and will merge in under the current system. But also an important point to bear in mind is that um, as, as has been pointed out earlier, many other parties, minor parties with similar set of values to ours, which we could call teals, hypothetically call teals, for example, are deregistered or about to be deregistered. And if you if someone were to go through the AEC register parties right now and have a look at which ones survived this audit, Fusion is the only teal party. So we possess, we are in a significant political niche and we have a strong presence there and we have a strong community based on this idea that we are different values and identities coming together. Andrew? Yeah, yeah, just um, on the point that everyone understands the coming together and why we did that. I'm not sure I agree with that. I find it confusing, and I think I would find it confusing as a voter to be presented with the fusion story um, if I didn't, if I hadn't been involved in it. I don't think it's a strong point for a party looking to be elected to make. I think it's it's good to mention, but I don't think it's it's not the headline, yeah. A strong identity at the time of the election. I think it's it's nice as an origin story, but I wouldn't lead with it. We just went through a referendum where the entire opposition, their argument was it's too confusing and there's not enough detail. And and in response to that, the Yes campaign had a, had a very, very simple, and admittedly it did fail, but from our perspective, they had a very simple, straightforward message, which is this is what it is. This is what we're asking for. And in fusion, people understand a coalition and they'll understand when we say we're a coalition coming together to campaign together. Uh, I, I agree with Andrew's point that, you know, it's an interesting backstory, but like we need an actual, you know, we need actual policies, actual values. I think that's more important. Yeah. I found, we it, quite clearly. I found that last year at last year's election, people didn't know if we were one party or many parties. And I'd prefer them to be asking what's your policy rather than are you one party or are you lots of parties? I didn't have a single person ask me that. Maybe we had different experiences, but then I guess there is the issue of uh, anecdotal evidence. So in terms of the numbers, 
we are growing. We have more volunteers every month. We have more members every month. We have strong, positive cash flow. We have a very robust and detailed set of policies. These are things we're, we're promoting and putting out there. Like we have uh, active volunteers developing these and promoting these. And so there's, um, there's, there's, there's something which we say in community organizing, which is when you uh, are presented with an idea which you don't understand at first, but it's presented in good faith, then there's a concept of, of, of sitting or holding the space or, or sitting with the idea for a while. And so sometimes when an idea doesn't seem like it's immediately apparent what's happening with it, then that tension can be a good thing. Out of that tension, there's innovation. Out of, out, out of that um, out of the disagreement comes new ideas and new structures. And so as long as we can hold on to that, then our message is that we can collaborate across different ideas. We can bring together different ideas and dissolving and losing all that, that, that that's a, that's a non-starter. I mean, I mean, even the name of the party, the logo of the party is a specific reference. The, pol the philosophies of the party all specifically reference these different identities and cultures coming together. There's holding space for an idea when you're invested in the idea and working towards an outcome. There's also the political reality that we have very little time to engage the voting public. So the... The complexities that we're talking about here are maybe relevant to building the organisation, but the public image that the party puts out has to resonate on first sight with voters if getting votes is the intention. But do we want a short-term strategy or do we want to build a long-term movement? Because a short-term focus on on perfect branding, perfect policies, on a name which people are like, oh, yeah, okay, that might work. I, That's I, a short-term strategy. I think you want a, a winning strategy, short-term and long-term. But the short-term strategy has to be supported by a long-term strategy. Otherwise, it's not a winning strategy. Yep. I mean, I think... does, does anyone here, is anyone here think we have a chance of getting 4% in 2025? What, yeah, what, absolutely. And how how would we get that? How would we get that four percent? We're already growing, and as you said, like um, you know, the other sort of teal parties, they're already you know being cut from the audit. Mm -hmm. I think um, especially as the climate crisis gets worse and worse, you know, people are going to turn away from Liberal and Labor. They're mm -hmm. going to notice, like, hey, you guys have had you know decades. Literally, these two have been in power ever since Federation you know, their predecessor parties and then changing names and things. It's always been these two. And they'll mm -hmm. see, like, what's happening with the housing crisis? What's happening with, like, the rising sea levels? It's yep. the same two parties always making politically easy decisions to cling on to power. You know, my hope is that the public will eventually think, you know, we've been lied to for decades. These people have to go. They, you know, should belong more in prison than in parliament. A Andrew and Bryony might be able to back me up when I say that, that was our rationale for the last 10 years. And in the last 10 years, I think we cracked 2% once. I think Science Party got 2%. We got 3.5% in Sydney, and that was through mm -hmm. following the advice of a campaign manager who had strong experience and knew how to campaign and got the material out early. It's um, There's nothing wrong with the policy platform. There's nothing, I don't think the um, the structure of the party has much relevance. It's doing things to get in front of people's eyeballs. It's getting in the media. Yeah, I, I think um, there's a lot of the, a lot of this conversation, I, I think there were various points being made that are sort of, uh, well, Andrew, you said it sort of just there, of like, that are, I think somewhat irrelevant to the, the structure of the party itself. Like there are certain, certain things guiding the structure, but the strategy, uh, there's probably the majority of the strategy, strategy decisions uh, need to be made in the same context or in the same way, I said either way. Um, in terms of the structure and, and certain of these things, I think it's more, it should be more about 
um, recognizing or, or highlighting what resources there are, how they're being allocated and where those resources, like wh whether or not there are uh, uh, blockers to those resources being allocated in the right way or being spread too thin. Mm -hmm. There are certainly cases when it comes to the branches of uh, admin resources being sort of duplicated or sorry, oh, ad admin, admin roles or, or, or work being duplicated. Um, and and certain things of sort of lack of sort of focus or things being in multiple places or or, or not being sort of able to kind of consolidate in certain ways and so there are certainly uh, improvements to be made there sort of one way or another um there's multiple or, uh, ideally multiple solutions to it um but yeah it, overall regardless of what we're doing it's um it sort of uh what Andrea area said is that's and Kind of what both of you have said is is sort of finding the strategy like like a singular strategy and having that being a unifying uh thing that we focus on where we make sure we actually all have the same goals of hmm. um trying to create uh yeah trying to trying to field uh competent candidates who can campaign well uh and for probably resource them and support them to do a good job so what i'm hearing is that Effective campaigning, good logistics, large numbers of volunteers, that's what wins elections and that's what gets votes. I, I don't think, may, maybe, maybe it is controversial, but uh, it shouldn't be controversial when I say that a perfect set of policies won't win us an election and a perfect branding won't win us an election. And, and there's a very nice corollary, well, no, there's a very strong corollary also to say that a lot of money won't win us an election either but that's sort of less relevant. But what wins elections is having a, a strong, ultimately a strong and growing and healthy community, uh, a, a vibrant and visionary political movement, which has a clear philosophy underlying it. And and our, our founding story, which we should enshrine and carry forward for, for, for practical reasons to bring in future branches outside of fusion, but also for philosophical and visionary reasons in that this is something which has never been done before never been tried before, but we're doing it and it's working. We are growing. We are making victories month by month in out. And, and we, we've seen the data for that. We've seen the stats for that. And so what matters now is whether we can make use of those functional benefits of the structure to bring in external parties. And there's good science to say that maybe that will work. But obviously, there's a, there's a lot of luck and opportunity there. So, so the more important thing is looking at the philosophy and whether the underlying philosophy that brought us together is something that can work because it needs to be visionary and it needs to be different. We can't just repeat the same things that we've done for the last 10 years that haven't worked. I mean, I would say some of the metrics raised, I mean, I, I, there are some things that I don't quite, uh, some of the metrics raised of like growing and, and, and certain things. I mean, Science Party was certainly was also growing, um, like, oh, like it's probably similar uh, in like sort of sim similar um, uh, rates with a lot of these things. Um, I mean, I'm still, again, I'm much prefer the, um, the merger and the more sort of more hands on deck in, in general um but um yeah i mean generally a lot of the stuff was stuff that sort of science party was trying to do as well just with uh just fewer resources um but yeah i mean i think i think generally with with most things in strategy in the last little while i think people have been on the same page for the most part but i think we need to identify if for anything else i think people need to be identifying very specific things that they want to change. I guess that's all about the um the branch changes and everything. Um, Saha, do we have time to chat about transparency still? No, it's okay. We have about oh, seven okay. minutes. So I'm happy because this discussion um was one worth having and I think better we have it now rather than during the AGM so much so this is really good to discuss um, I'll save mine for another month
Yeah, as I say, I was most interested in knowing the differences between the two proposed versions of the constitution because, I, you know, AGM, um, I won't be coming to the AGM prepared to debate. For me, that's a time for voting. Uh, the, the voting will happen over the two weeks. On the special or is it the, uh, um, we're voting uh, special resolutions on the day. Yeah, the, the candidates is the next two weeks, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, so I was I was interested also in the um some of the changes surrounding election to the executive committee. Um so there was the deputy um positions that are listed but they're not listed as elected positions in Miles's draft and then in Saha's draft the um the removal of the national campaigns coordinator um from one of the sections oh sorry I should have written down what my question was there um I think it's the national campaigns coordinator is not to be elected but they're still on the committee so that suggests that they're appointed. Sorry, let me open up the draft. Yeah, so under my draft, the deputy office bearers would be appointed. I think that's a um that's probably a fair interpretation. But there's a high chance that um we wouldn't get nominations for the deputy positions. Um, uh, unless we sort of encourage people to consider them on the basis that they are, um, they're they're almost like sort sort of internship positions in a way that it's a good way to, um, to learn more about specific roles, before jumping in to take on the full responsibilities for it. I think there was also the comp um wasn't there, there was a conversation at some point that if the constitutional changes happen. Like the like the order of operations with the constitutional changes happening before deputies are uh, mandated by the constitution, then they they didn't exist at the time prior to the AGM. They then the the role exists after the fact, so the 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 vote can't happen until after it, or like the 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 voting appointment can't happen. There was some there was some technical issues there that were raised. I think is that I don't know if that's still relevant. Yeah, the, the elections have to be held in accordance with the current constitution. So then what happens yes. to the my, roles that get my, mixed? My preferred, yeah, my preferred interpretation of that is that the um, changes to the roles wouldn't take effect until after um, uh, after the, the, the current set of nominations close. So effectively, um, the, the, the voting of the nominations would go for the current existing set which would um of, of positions defined in the constitution which would then hold for 12 months and then the agm next year we would then vote for the change positions we brought in this year yeah i think that's important to clarify on the day then okay So we have a PDC meeting at eight, don't we? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't had RSVPs from uh, many, so I'll probably continue on. I'll just continue on with this uh, in this room um, as we go. Um, I think as, I'm, as I was looking, it looks like the events, I, I, the, the recurring event expired again. I thought I had put it up for longer, so it might be that there has been a thing I mean, this has been running for many fortnights. So, but uh, yeah, I'll do a blast out to some people. Um, I have to head off. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks. Thank you all. All right, I'm going to get some dinner as well. See you later, guys. See ya.